Okay. I have 10 o'clock, so let's rock. Okay. This is log analysis with the Elk stack, and the Elk stack is composed of Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. I'm Gary Smith. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington. It is a DOE lab, Department of Energy. Although what we do in my building, which is the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, really doesn't have that much to do with energy. We do lots of things at the lab uh, that are related to energy. Uh, we also do a lot of biological science, a lot of chemistry, a lot of things with surface chemistry, a lot of things with proteins. Um, it's uh, some really wild and crazy stuff. Here are pictures of some of our happy researchers doing their, their research thing and some of the equipment we have in the background. Um, we have a large supercomputer there at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, actually one of several. Um, I am responsible for the security for it and its infrastructure. Um, that's actually a pretty big, pretty big job. Um, but um, since I do security, how do I think about security? So let's have a little context about security. This is how I think about it. And I use what I call the five golden principles of security. Uh, you can probably go out to the internet and find these particular ones, and this is not necessarily uh, something that I can take credit for. All I will take credit for is putting them in this order because it helps me remember them because no is at the top and the bottom. Principles two and four both start with P, which makes it easy to remember. And the central concept is there in the middle, defense in depth. Know your system. Know what runs on your system. Know what your user base is like. Since the network is the system, as we know from Sun's advertising from the 80s and 90s before they were gobbled up by Oracle, the network is the system. So know what runs on your network. What does your network traffic look like? Where is it coming from? Where is it going to? Principle of least privilege. That says don't give any person, job, process, group more privilege than they absolutely need to have. Classic example of this is do you really want the president of the company to have the password to root? Probably not. Defense in depth. The defense in depth is the center idea. Um, if you consider a a, a tree ring. It's composed of multiple rings and that's the way you want to design your security is multiple layers of security. Don't just do one thing and say, okay, that's enough. I'm okay. Protection is key, but detection is a must. Patching is good. Staying up with the latest updates is great. But if you don't know that something has gone bad, you've lost the battle. And that's mostly what today is about is about that detection component because we're going to be talking about how to look at syslogs. The last one is know your enemy. This is very important. Know what kind of techniques the enemy is going to use to break in. Learn those techniques. Study those techniques. Learn to think like your enemy. Classify who your enemy is, what he's going to be interested in. Learn those techniques. Apply them. Close the holes before they have the chance. So, as I mentioned, we have uh, a supercomputer there at um, PNNL, and we have had a series of them along the way. Our previous supercomputer was named Chinook. We had a contest uh, when Chinook was coming in to name it, and the choice that everybody above the selection panel was Chinook. I'm not sure why they pick Chinook, but, uh, or if there was any reason for it, but a Chinook is either a nearly extinct variety of salmon, a hot, strong wind that melts all the snow, or a medium-duty helicopter from Sikorsky. So I'm not sure why they picked it, but we picked Chinook. Um, through most of Chinook's lifetime, I used Splunk to analyze the logs, and I use the, the free version of Splunk. Um, the free version is, uh, has an interesting little caveat on it. Um, it's free as long as you don't 
ingest more than 500 megabytes of logs a day. If you do this too often uh, over some period of time, I think a week, uh, three times in a week, it will keep indexing your data, but it just won't let you see it unless you call up Splunk and say, hi, I need to buy the paid version. Um, where do I insert the dollars? So their, their licensing model is sort of like an all-you-can-eat buffet where you pay by the pound. The more you eat, the more you pay. Um, the problem um, I was having is that I had to constantly fiddle with syslogng, which I was using and still use, as the log aggregator from all of the nodes that are inside that were inside Chinook to keep junk out so that I wouldn't go over that 500 megabyte limit a day. Now, a little bit about um, Chinook. Chinook had approximately 14,000 nodes and eight cores per node. So I'll let you do the arithmetic and figure out how many sites of computation that was. Um, a lot. Um, there are also 20,000 disks, which I had to erase recently, but that's another story. Um, so I was constantly fiddling with syslog and G to keep things out so that I didn't go over that 500 megabyte limit and could still use the, um, the free version of Splunk. And even then, when I did that, it would frequently go over, and what I would do is I'd just say, well, okay, so much for all my old data. Just reinstall Splunk and start over from the beginning, which was a colossal drag because I lost all that stuff. But uh, that, that was the problem that I was having. Now, um, eventually we decided to get rid of Chinook and buy something newer and more modern, and we again had a naming contest, and the naming contest, this time I got smart rather than, than trying to submit a name, I got on the panel to select the name. So we picked Cascade for the name of our new supercomputer. Um, I don't know whether the decision was to um, name it after a range of mountains or a dishwashing detergent. So, but we, we've got Cascade. Actually, having it named Cascade is a bit of a problem because our previous supercomputer was named Chinook, and they both start with C, and they both start with a hard C. So, unfortunately, people still, even to this day, say uh, Chinook when they mean Cascade. Um, Cascade has roughly the same number of nodes as Chinook did, roughly 1,400, but it has 32 cores per node. So I'll let you do the arithmetic and figure out how many sites of execution that is. Um, Cascade does come up in the top 30 of the supercomputers in the world. So that's just a, a, an idea of how big it is. Um, now in terms of, just, in, just to give you an idea in terms of physical size, um, Cascade is actually one-tenth the size of Chinook. That's how much miniaturization and uh, small form factors have taken over. Okay, but um, if I'm going to have two supercomputers and I'm pushing this limit of 500 megabytes a day into uh, Splunk, if I've got two of them operating at the same time while Chinook is still running and Cascade is being brought into finalization, there's just no way that I'm going to stay under that 500 megabyte limit with, um, with Splunk. And for the amount of data that would be coming in with Splunk's um, uh, pricing model, it was just going to be cost prohibitive to, to run Splunk. It was going to be well over two to $300,000 for the amount of data that would be coming in, and that's that's a lot. So um, when we started talking about bringing in Cascade, which was um, about a year before we actually got it in, I started looking at alternatives to Splunk, basically anything that might be able to um, uh, fill the logging analysis bill. This is not all the ones I looked at. This is just mostly the ones that I could remember or I had notes for. Um, Greylog 2, 
Uh, some people like it, um, its user interface, well, it has a, it looks like somebody like Pepto-Bismol for colors. Um, I'm guessing that this one here, the third one from the top, Octopussy, I'm guessing whoever, like, whoever generated it was a James Bond fan. Um, but there are, there are lots of them that I tried. Uh, this is just a partial list of all of them. Um, problems. Some just wouldn't build. I go through their build instructions and they just didn't build. Some just didn't work. Uh, that's not too surprising. Some were slow. Or in some cases, some of them just had an absolutely abysmal user interface and that's not what I was looking for. Um, because even though I expected other people to be using this besides just me. Um, generally speaking, all of them had some kind of a, re a relational database back end, something like MySQL or PostgreSQL uh, for storage and retrieval. Now, I am basically a system administrator type. I am not a DBA and I do not play one on television either. Um, one of the problems with both MySQL and PostgreSQL is that if you, even though you may mark a record as being deleted, it's not really deleted. It's just marked as being deleted. So at some point, you've got to go through and do some kind of compression to get rid of the deleted records, which is a bit of a drag. Um, that was one of the things that I wanted to get rid of uh, and bypass, was having to constantly do that because uh, as you delete records, things get put on the end, you've got to go back and do the compress, and your um, performance goes down the more deleted records you have because you've got to skip over them. So, I stumbled onto what eventually was going to be my solution, the ELK stack, which is composed of Elasticsearch, that does our indexing, storing, and retrieval, Logstash, which is our input slicer and dicer, it's the vegematic of uh, syslog lines, and Kibana, which is our um, program that's going to be doing our data display. So, um, I started working with the ELK stack in its early days, and in the early days of ELK, it was sort of like a, um, a kindergarten playground the little kitties didn't play well together. Um, the early versions of Logstash needed specific versions of Elasticsearch in order to run, and Kibana wanted the latest version of Elasticsearch, and it just didn't work too well. So um, I tried some alternatives to ELK in my search for the, um, the perfect logging analysis solution. One of the ones I tried, I call EFC, which was Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana. And this really worked pretty well. Um, FluentD takes uh, stuff from Syslog and knows the right way to send it all up in packages to Elasticsearch, and then you can look at it with Kibana. And it's really great. You just install FluentD, point, your, point it at your Syslogs, point uh, Kibana at Elasticsearch, and bingo, it works, it's great, it's simple, it's quick, it's easy, but it's not very flexible. If you want to do any kind of extended sorts of analysis with um, your logging data, um, FluentD doesn't give you that capability. It's basically just a uh, program that hands off from Syslog straight into Elasticsearch. So um, I, I gave up on this one. Another one that I tried, I call ERC, which is Elasticsearch, our Syslog D, and Kibana. Um, Syslog, our Syslog uh, has a plugin that will take Syslog data and directly stick it into Elasticsearch. This is great because all you need to do is just drop your plugin in, point your uh, Syslogs into our Syslog to be a collector, then point your um, plug-in into Elasticsearch, and you're good to go. This is great. It works. Um, the problem is, is that this is only available in the very latest version of Elasticsearch, so uh, in uh, Syslog D, our Syslog D. 
So you've got to build the latest RSS log D and you've got to build the plugin. And this doesn't work if you're using the latest version of Red Hat, which was at that time 6.x, because Red Hat in their wonderful goal of maintaining stability was two major releases behind on RSS log. So now you've got the problem of oh, I've got to maintain RSS log D in addition to the plugin because I don't, can't get uh, the right plugins from Red Hat. So I tried that, it worked, it was great, but it didn't give me the flexibility that I eventually wanted to put into my logging and analysis. So over time, the dysfunctional family of elk got together and now they all work together and play together and it's just one big happy family. Most of this was due to the members of Elasticsearch um, getting together with Kibana and Logstation saying, look guys, we need to work together on this. Let's get our act together so that we can have one big happy family and make everything work. So how does this in general work? Um, what I have is I've got syslogs coming in from several different places. I have it being generated by syslog, I have it generating by our syslog, I have it generating by our syslog D. And these all go into my centralized syslog server, which is running syslog ng. Syslog ng is a very industrial strength, enterprise grade uh, syslog daemon. It has lots of capabilities and it is just fantastic for handling throughput. Syslog G in turn sends it to Logstash. Logstash um, is sort of like a, uh, a Vegematic. It slices, it dices, it makes julienne fries out of your syslog data and then sends that over to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is then queried by Kibana to make interesting looking displays and show you what your syslog data looks like. So let's talk about each one of those components and I'm going to talk about them in the order of the data stream, not the order of, of the name. Um, I wonder how many marketing people it took to figure out, we're going to call this thing elk rather than lek or kel. <laughs> Got to wonder. Um, but elk is, elk is a nice name. It goes right up there with lamp and wamp and ramp. Yes, sir. What use is this to um, Most of that is, is somewhat historical. I have used syslog ng for a long time and I know how it works and although I don't have any real quibbles with our syslog, um, it's to take what I am currently doing and have had in production with syslog ng for, for a number of years and convert that over to our syslog is just not something that I wanted to do. Um, but I have no quibbles with our syslog. It's a fine product. Um, the guy who, the main guy who is working on it, um, I can't remember the chap's name, but he's very responsive to emails and he's very helpful. And I thought I saw a question over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so it looks like you're using Logstash to kind of bake this data. Um, does yes. Does syslog ng your central server? do enough of that baking so the, the kind of disparities between the different types of uh, client syslogs, does it, does it clean it up enough or do you have to do much of that with Logstash? I do all of that with Logstash. Yeah, okay. um, it used to be that I had, when I was using Splunk, I had a lot of filtering right. stuck into uh, my, syslog my syslog ng definitions to get rid of the massive amounts of stuff that wasn't terribly useful that was clogging up the log and pushing me over 500 megabytes. I have ripped almost all of that out now. Um, there is very little filtering that I do anymore and this makes my syslog ng configuration much uh, simpler to maintain, not to mention uh, cutting down the overhead that syslog ng has to do. Uh, syslog ng now just acts as a big uh, collection point um, and I shoot the data out into various different, different ways. One of the things I do is I have an all-inclusive file where everything that comes in goes to that file. 
and then I filter it by the facility code. I figure uh, by the um, I do some special filtering based on some applications like sudo and su. Um, I do uh, filtering by the um, severity code. Those all go into different files so that I have those for so that I can look at those for particular instances. But that's basically all the filtering that I do now. Um, any kind of big gross manipulations, which you can do with syslog ng, I leave that to Logstash now. Um, and Logstash does a wonderful job of it. Um, it's, a little, it's a little tough to get through the first part because um, sys, Logstash seems to use a lot of punctuation as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yeah, you, you've noticed that too. Um, but uh, once you kind of get used to it, it's pretty easy to turn the stuff out. And um, there's some things I wish that, that were in Logstash, like looping, which is not there, but that's really not too big a deal. Um, so, Logstash. Logstash was developed by Jordan Sissel when he was working at DreamHost, if you know anything about DreamHost. Um, Jordan needed something that could handle a peak of 20,000 messages per second. Gee, that's a lot. Um, so he invented Logstash, and now that is his job. That is his job now. He does nothing but Logstash. Um, Logstash is relatively easy to set up. It is very scalable and is easy to extend. Um, if you go out to uh, the Logstash site, which is logstash.net, and listen to any of Jordan's um, presentations, there is one thing that he is very adamant about, and I will, I will paraphrase what he says. Don't invent new crap time formats. There are enough crappy time formats out there in the world already that we don't need any new ones. And just look at the difference between the way different syslogs do it, we have the ways different applications do it, where they put them within the records, it's just a mess. And we, if you use somebody else's time format, don't, don't bother with, with something else, inventing your own. Generally, there's two kind of Logstash hosts. Um, sometimes you use Logstash to forward onto another Logstash server. That's not really use that much anymore, but you can do that. But what you really want is you really have a central log stash host that acts as a archiver, indexer, and um, web interface, and it receives and processes and stores your logs. A log stash configuration file has three basic parts, input, filter, and output. Input says where your input comes from. Filter is where the rubber meets the road and you do your processing and output is just where you're going to send it to. Okay, now when I did an earlier version of this presentation, I went through a log stash configuration file with some of my peers and I could see that their eyes were glazing over and they were starting to fall asleep. So I threw that out and now I'm just going to talk about the individual pieces rather than do a, a walkthrough of what it looks like. But inputs. There are lots of different kinds of inputs that Logstash has. It can take input from a file, so you can, it works like tail-f. So you point it at, a sys, at your syslog data file, and it goes to the end and starts processing as it comes in. It can take syslog, ng, syslog data directly. You point a syslog um, daemon at, uh, at Logstash, and it will take it in and um, it listens over the standard port for syslog messages and anything that it follows that RFC up there for the format of a syslog message, it can handle. Um, you may be in a situation where you have a uh, system that is generating logs, but it doesn't have syslog ng or syslog or r syslog or one of those to send syslogs off to, um, to Logstash. Like, for instance, maybe some of Bill's stuff. Um, there's a program that uh, you can use called Lumberjack, uh, except it's not called Lumberjack anymore. It's called Logstash Forwarder. But there are versions of it for Linux, for Windows, for Mac OS that will forward syslogs using the Lumberjack protocol, which is a secure protocol that uses certs and keys and stuff. So. 
uh, the traffic is encrypted and sends it off to you send it off to a log stash agent. The filter section is where the rubber meets the road. This is the real workhorse section of um, of log stash. Uh, it has a whole lot of filters. If you go out to the log stash site, you will see that there are just tons of filters to do all different kinds of things. These are just some of the ones that, that um, I found practical use for. One is called Grok. Trivia question for you. What book does the term Grok come from? Very good. And it was written by Robert Heinlein. Yes, very good. Grok is the workhorse of, um, of filtering. Grok allows you to take your data stream and turn unstructured data into structured data by matching it against patterns. And we'll talk a little bit about these patterns a little bit later on. But when, think of patterns as being something like a regular expression. Oh dear, regular expressions. Um, there are a bunch of built-in patterns in log stash, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There, it makes it um, a lot easier to build up. One of the other filters that I use, I have used frequently, is one called mutate. And every time I type mutate, I think I'm doing something with the X-Men. Mutate allows you to change things around, replace fields, modify fields. For instance, one of the things that I found it useful for was turning blanks into underscores or making everything lowercase. Um, drop is a useful filter. If something is not what you expect, just drop it. It goes away. It's gone. Completely dead. It never, got, uh, no more processing does, gets done. A very useful one, we'll see a use for this, is GOIP. GOIP takes an IP address and turns it into a geographic location. And this lets you do some amazing graphing feats with Kibana, which we will see later if my demo works. I had partial success with my demo yesterday. The output section. Output is the final, uh, final thing. Uh, you can output into lots of different things. For instance, and the one we're primarily interested in is Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch puts your data out there in some kind of queryable format, and Elasticsearch is, believe me, is the way to go. Uh, you can write it to a file on disk. I have found this to be a useful debugging technique to make sure that things were happening as I really want, wanted them to. If you have a StatsD server, you can send it directly to StatsD, and StatsD can take that and uh, aggregate that into uh, useful information over the long term. If we look at Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch um, is, is really a tremendous program. Um, the idea is, is that with Elasticsearch, searching is easy. Ordinarily, searching is a hard problem in computer science. Um, it is released under the Apache license, so um, it's free to use. How does Elasticsearch work? Well, Elasticsearch, unlike Postgres or, or MySQL or something like that, it's an indexing engine. It is not a database, although I suppose some people could say that it's a, it's a NoSQL database. But it works like an index in a book. If, I'm, if I've got, say, a book on physics and I want to find something out about Richard Feynman, I go straight to the index and I look up Feynman, comma, Richard, and there it is, and there's a whole bunch of references for it. So then I go off to page 131 to see something about Feynman diagrams, and bingo, there I am. I didn't have to search through the whole book or go through the table of contents to find something about Richard Feynman. I went straight to the index and found what I wanted, and consequently, it is very, very fast. Um, Elasticsearch configuration is pretty easy. Uh, all you need to do to really get it going is uh, you can define, all you have to do is two things, and you don't even have to really do those. Define what your cluster is. There's a pre-named cluster called Elasticsearch, and there's a predefined node name for it as well. And if you don't pick one, it will pick at random a node name from among all of the X-Men. Um, 
it's actually, that's kind of fun to look at the file, the log file, and see which one it picks when you restart it. But I've, I've carried on the tradition, and um, all of the uh, Elasticsearch in instances I have are named after characters in the X-Men. Um, but it's very easy to manipulate the file. You just edit Elasticsearch.yaml, and it's a YAML-based file, so it's readable by humans, unlike XML, which is not readable by humans at all. Okay, the last piece is Kibana. Kibana um, is the interface into Elasticsearch that allows you to pull the data out. Um, Elasticsearch uses uh, the what's called the Lucene syntax to get data in and out, and that's actually just what you would think. It uses and or not, and you just type what it is, type what you're interested in searching. Um, you can build very complex queries with it. You can build all kinds of nice graphs and visualizations. You can produce tables. You can produce maps. You can produce charts. Kibana is really a, your interface into what's been put into Elasticsearch. So, at this point, let's see if the demo works. And let's see, I probably need to try to, uh, how about that? Drag that over, and if we click that, okay, that's pretty good. Okay, if you have got everything configured up with Elasticsearch and Kibana and Logstash, and they're all working together, which is really not too difficult, and you point your browser at whatever the IP address is, slash Kibana, bingo, you get this page that starts up and says, basically says, hi, welcome to Kibana, and all this good stuff, and we're ready to rock and roll. But you want to look at your data, so you go over here and you click the basic dashboard, and Round and round the circle goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. Ah, now what I did is I took a week's worth of syslog data from one of my um, syslog files, and I've ingested that into Elasticsearch courtesy of Logstash, and we have it here to look at. And this is the basic thing that it fires up when you first fire it up. Um, we've got a nice little histogram plot of activity over the days, and we've got this raw stuff from our, from our syslog. And these are various fields that have been populated inside of Logstash, uh, inside of, from Logstash into Elasticsearch. So let's just pretty this up just a tiny bit, and let's start out with, let's look at the timestamp and our host name that reported something, and the program that reported it, and the message. And bingo, well, this doesn't look too bad, does it? Gee, um, we can see that uh, the times and the node names and what the program was and the actual message that we were interested in. So, let's see. Um, I come in in the morning, and um, I want to see some activity that's happened in the previous day. Now, I have several nodes that are directly attached to the internet, so they have a lot of syslog, I have a lot of SSH coming in from around the world as researchers are coming in to uh, run programs on the supercomputer or, or put stuff on our archive server. Well, we also got a lot of bad actors who are trying to get in for one reason or the other. So I'm curious, I have a program called Fail to Ban running on those nodes that are directly attached to the internet to block out the bad actors on SSH. If you haven't ever used Fail to Ban, check it out. It's a great program for filtering out all kinds of badness um, from, a, from the internet. So I, I know from looking at my logs actually, let me type that again, B-A-N, that fail to ban puts the, fra puts the word ban whenever it bans somebody into its, um, 
into its syslog records. And bingo, I see that for a time period that the, every one of these bars represents an instance where an IP address has gotten banned, and there's the, ad, there's the node that did the banning, and there's, of course, the program fail to ban actions, and I can see, um, I'm looking at this from a rather oblique angle, but there's the, uh, there's the IP address that it came from, and, of course, there's um, a username that they tried to get in on. A lot of them are root. Okay, um, another thing I can do when I come in in the morning is I know that um, um, SSH, the SSH daemon, puts a particular log string into the log, into the log file. It's really hard to type when you can't see what's being typed. Okay, do I have that right? Fail? No, nope, not quite. It also corrects your English a little bit. Okay, failed password for. And round and round the circle goes. This is all working on a VM on my work on my laptop here. Okay. This is all of that activity for a particular for a particular day. I've got the. Um, Timestamp, the host, of course it was SSHD, and I can see there was a fail password for uh, root and all of these other different um, usernames and the IP address that it worked for. Now, um, the great thing about Kibana, once you've gotten all of this work done with Logstash and Elasticsearch putting stuff in there, is that you can define dashboards that you can look at stuff. So, let's uh, have some dashboards here. Uh, let's see. Okay, and Kibana's definitions for dashboards, it's all a JSON file. Okay, I think that is Right, and bingo, around and around we go. Okay, so, ah, okay, let's do this. Um, you can select time ranges over which you want to see the data. So let's do the past 24 hours, and round and round we go. Okay, this is a dashboard that I've set up with Kibana. I have my strip chart that shows all my activity for the past 24 hours. And I have defined a panel inside a row of my top 10 hosts that are sending out syslog messages so I can see which nodes in my infrastructure and in my supercomputer are logging the most, sending out the most uh, syslog messages. Well, E1, he's always chatty. He's always sending out a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then I can see what processes are sending out the most number of syslog messages. In this case, SMBD audit, and I know from experience working with this, that this is E1 doing stuff with Samba. So I know that this is normal activity. This is all normal activity. This goes back to that point about the first principle of, of security. Know your system. Know what is normal for your system. Then down here I have um, a whole set of just of stuff if I want to look at individual, the individual pieces of, of log messages. Now, the great thing about Kibana is that it is reconfigurable very much so on the dynamic. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink that panel down to four and save that. And I'm going to take this other panel here and I'm going to shrink it down to four. Um, 
this width here for a row is 12. It's 12 units. The reason it's 12 units is that lots of numbers divide 12, whereas not very many numbers divide 10. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go over here and I'm going to add another panel. And I'm going to make it of type terms because terms works real well with syslog type data. And I'm going to call this uh, security events. And I didn't spell security right. S E C U R I T Y E V N T S. Okay. And I'm going to make it four for the width. Now the field that I'm interested in is what I've gone done is I've gone through and I have laboriously looked at my syslog data and I have gone through and I have categorized certain event types that are of interest to me, plowed that back into Logstash to identify those events and put a tag on those syslog records as they come through. Now what's a tag? A tag is physically analogous to a post-it note. It's like I write something on a post-it note and I stick it on it and it goes with it. So by tagging a record, a syslog record, with one of those post-it notes and the tags array, which flies along as a part of uh, the way Logstash works, I can go back and say I'm interested in, the ta in tags. And if you don't know what a field name is, it will... Kibana knows what the, all the fields are named, so you just type them in and it actually gives you choices that you can put in there. So you don't have to remember what they all are. And let's do 10, we're gonna do a count, and we're not interested in seeing that. And we save that. And now it comes back and it recalculates and bingo! Now I've got a look at what my system security events of interest were. And let's see, I'm going to step over here. Okay, big one. Root SSH failed. ICMP packet dropped on output. Well, eh, that's kind of too interesting. SSHD field on, failed on external authorization. Well, that's people coming in from outside trying to get in. SSH failed. This is internal. This is people that couldn't type their password on the inside. TCP packet dropped on output, dropped on input. IP address banned. This is the number of times it failed to ban, did something for me, and banned an address. This was when it got unbanned. Uh, this is an interesting promiscuous mode detected. A nick went into promiscuous mode and a UDP packet dropped. So now by going through and knowing what my logs look like and what interests me in categorization of events, I can look at security events and get a whole range of things there. Um, and you saw how easy that was to fire up in Kavana and make that change. It didn't require any programming. I just had to kind of know what my data looked like. I kind of had to know, gee, I'm interested in this. And it automatically threw it into this nice bar graph for me. Um, let me do one little thing just to show you here. Oh, OK. And notice that I have auto update on. It's updating every minute. Uh, you can turn that off, and I usually like to turn that off for larger things. But let's uh, just, just do, you know, show you that. Turn auto update off, and um, let's try it for a whole week. Because I have a week's worth of data, and let's just show you what a week's worth of data, how that works. And round and round the circle goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. I think when I tried this, uh, it took about two minutes. Now this is this is a this is a MacBook running um, VirtualBox, running all the stuff on it. So it's not going to be real fast. This may not eventually do anything. But see how easy that was to do with Kaban. Yes, sir. In terms of the user interface and how you change it, you using Splunk before? I was using Splunk before. Splunk's very sort of clicky, do things interactively. How, how does Kibana compare with that? 
I would say it's on a par. In the search results, can you type in a word and add it to the search bar like you can in the phone? Um, I actually, I should I should have showed that uh, earlier. Um, it's just something you could do. We had a we had a question over here. Yes, sir. Yes, just in regards to Splunk as well. If you had the opportunity to pay for Splunk, would you have done that over using Yelp? <sighs> That's a tough question. I'm in the same boat. I'm in that exact position. Yeah. Like currently, I have millions being chucked at me to go and do something for logging. Uh, is always my favorite due to the fact that it's free and open source. Well, However, yeah. they're just as apt to throw the money at Splunk. So, um, really curious. If, if, I if I didn't have to... Uh, pardon? <laughs> yeah, if... Um, I, I believe that, that uh, now, that I am, now that I've gotten into using Elasticsearch, Logstash and Kibana, even if I had the choice of Splunk for free, I think I would prefer to stay with this simply because I have a lot more customization ability with it than I think I could get with Splunk. Um, don't, don't get me wrong, Splunk is a wonderful program. Splunk is a great program. But Splunk tries to be everything to everybody. And maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you don't want all of that overhead, all of that bloat. Maybe you want something that you can control more. And I think that Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana give you that control. And you can't beat the price. Yes, sir? Is there an alerting feature in all this? Is there? Alerting? Alerts based on keyword search? Yes, you can do. You can, with Logstash, based on some kind of uh, uh, conditional. Say, you know, the, you get um, um, emergency, an emergency alert. You can, one of the outputs is mail. So you could say, okay, have I gotten five, five alerts for mail of this particular type? For five alerts of emergency from this particular note. Okay, send out email and then that goes to a pager. Yeah, you can do that kind of thing. Yes, sir. So I was going to actually answer it. I was going to ask you about this as well. If you played with the, what's called the percolator API, it's, it's part of uh, Elasticsearch. Um, uh, alert on it's yeah. yeah. You can register a search and throw data at it. It tells you which of those searches match that data. So you can actually uh, implement alerting them. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. It's like a save search. I haven't played with that portion of it so much. I've mostly... Um, I have mostly worked with the two ends, with Logstash and Kibana on, on each end, and not so much with Elasticsearch because it just works. It, uh, there's not much to do with it. Um, let's see. Um, this is for a whole week's worth of data. And um, just to show you something that you can do, you can rake across, and bingo, it will now expand all that out. And every one of these graphs and charts gets updated according to what you've selected. Yes, sir. You mean like over here? Oh, sure. Uh, let's see. Um, what does that say? SSH auth failed. Okay. What we do is we go back over here to configure and we go to the panel and we say SSH underscore auth underscore fail. Fail. F A I L. Does that? That's it. That looks good. Okay. And. We we'll save and let's do a. I don't need to do a recalculate and round and round the circle goes and. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't type it right, did I? It's SSHD. Okay. Sometimes I think the world might end because 
of poor typing at NORAD. <laughs> okay, SSHD off fail. That looks better. And let's do a recalculate. Gone. Now something else has popped up. Should be. Yep, SSH brute force, brute force attacks. Yes, sir. Um, I have syslog and g set up to send everything to one big file. And then I have syslog and g also set up to categorize events based on facility, priority, and certain applications. So those are getting logged separately. And then everything that goes into my all-inclusive file is also being sent into Elasticsearch. So I have I'm, I'm keeping the data preserved that way. Um, Have you noticed uh, a need to discard old data? Uh, yes, I, that, good question because I, I have something to talk about that in a minute. Um, okay, let's see, that's one dashboard I have set up. Um, let's see. Let's see, demo ssh event tracker.json. I think I got it typed right. Okay. Now, what I have done is I have defined a dashboard that looks at my ssh data of interest. And we don't have an hour ago, so let's just look at the past 24. Never tried that one. Okay. What I have now is um, by lo looking at my SSH type events, um, what I have done is I've defined a bunch of tags, and this chart here is based on those tags. And the way I've got it set up is that every time something gets banned, it's in red across the top. Here are my SSH hosts that are doing, that are getting banned the most, and this is a ban count here. <coughs> Remember I talked about that GOIP field? Okay, here are my top countries that are coming in on SSH. Hong Kong, China, France, United States, Ukraine, Macedonia, Russian Federation, Israel. My top cities, my top cities. Now, as an analyst, Here's the top SSH hosts that are coming in. And curiously enough, 43.255.190.174, 43.255.190.164, Notice a pattern here? Yes, this is all coming from Hong Kong. They're trying to get in through SSH. <coughs> what they're trying to do, <coughs> excuse me, is they are trying to find poorly configured SSH servers that allow root login. They're not going to find that for me. I know better. Okay, so there's my histogram plots. I know the top SSH hosts. I know the top SSH cities and the countries. Now I can take those IP addresses <coughs> and DOE has this thing called the Cyber Federated Model. I can put all of those IP addresses into what's called the Cyber Federated Model. Those IP addresses got, get spread out to all the different DOE sites and they can say, okay, I want to block 43.190.1.0 slash 24. Boom. And they will never see those again. So this is a way of getting information out to other people. But this makes it easy to capture that, that information. If I look at um, uh, what IP addresses got banned the most over time, sure enough, there's all those 43s. Now, the great thing about that GOIP in Kibana is I can put that in and I can create what I call a heat map 
I can show geographically where the most activity is coming from. And sure enough, the greener it is, the more activity there is. China, I mouse over it and it says 203 times over the past 24 hours. How many of you in sixth grade and you took geography thought geography was a waste of time? <laughs> Believe me, when you are dealing with attacks coming from around the world, a little bit of geography really helps you because uh, you, you know where the things are coming from. But here's an, another interesting plot that I have there. SSH usernames. What usernames are they trying the most? And by far, they are trying root the most. They are trying to find poorly configured SSH servers out there on the internet. And th these bars here show the relative counts for the nodes that I'm interested in. But anybody care if we ran this a little bit over long? Okay. Um, I have another dashboard that I have created. Let's see. Okay, DDIP. Oops, that's not quite right. Okay. And around we go. Okay, what kinds of interesting IP uh, IP tables information happens? And let's go and look at the last twenty four hours. Okay, I've got nodes out there on the internet, and they're trying various interesting parties are trying to connect to them with all sorts of interesting things. Um, so, well, gee, that looks interesting. I mouse over it, and I, it tells me that that's TCP packet dropped 49 for 10 minutes and the time. But I can see what countries this is all coming from. China, well, that's no big surprise there. United States, United Kingdom, Russian Federation, so on and so forth. Um, about this missing field, uh, mapping an IP address back to a geographic location is a rather inexact science, so sometimes you just can't do it. Um, but most, but I, I probably get at least 95 to 97 percent good hits. Um, what cities it's coming from? Now here's an interesting thing, destination ports. What ports are they trying to come in on? Uh, 1433, I have no idea what that is. 5060, that's a SIP channel for uh, voice over internet. Uh, 8888, that's uh, another alternative for HTTP. Uh, 8080, that's HTTP. Uh, some of these are just random ones. Uh, emails down there at the bottom. Um, but uh, there's there's my top addresses that are sending me stuff, and the number of counts, and a, and a much better, the IP, uh, the IP uh, map where they're showing where the they're all coming from, is a much better heat map because I get a lot more hits. Um, Kavana does pie charts, pie charts, pie charts. Managers love pie charts. Pie charts are readily understandable by managers. I have a pie chart there that shows the distribution of the three different major protocols that I'm interested in looking at, TCP, UDP, and ICMP. Now, one of the things that I can do is that I can also click on a geographic location on my heat map, and run and run we go. Maybe I didn't click on it hard enough. Hmm. Anyway, in theory, if this were working, I could click on a geographic region. It would show me just the traffic for that particular region. Yes, sir? Is there any way to uh, associate the IP addresses with known Tor exit nodes? <sighs> Maybe. I, I don't know about that one. Never, never had to work with that one, really. Okay. Um, but let's see, okay, just for grins, let's bring this up where we had a particularly high spike 
go back and look at that. Okay. Well, we sectioned that particular one out, and we can see that the major country was coming from the United Kingdom. It managed to beat China out, which is pretty good. It was all coming from London, and we can see the ports that they were trying, and that the bulk of it was TCP. So, very easy to define these, uh, these dashboards because you define them interactively. And you can save them off as J they save off as JSON files, and then you can make them into store them away and call them up when you need to. Uh, these are very useful for, say, uh, your senior analyst, your junior analyst, uh, to be able to spot trends and uh, bad stuff happening with um, with your network. Okay. Uh, you could go back up to, I've, I've unclicked them here, but uh, where is my pointer? Pointer, pointer, where's the pointer? Uh, I could go back up there to that query box, uh, open up that query box and query that uh, IP address, and I could see all of the time for a particular period that I was interested in when they may have been doing something. And that's... And that's a very real scenario that I have had to operate in, where either I get an email from headquarters saying, uh, do you have any activity on this particular, from this particular IP range? Or I'll notice a real big spike in, uh, in activity from uh, looking at the chart. And I go, OK, how long has this guy been doing stuff? Do I, how far, I want to go back for a week or two weeks or three weeks and see. Uh, has he been slowly ramping up his attention on our systems? And that's quite frequently uh, a very useful thing to do, is being able to see, okay, did they try maybe five or ten times uh, two weeks ago, and now they're trying 20 times last week, and now they're doing 3,000 times this week. So you can see a, a progression there. And I, I do that, I do have to do that frequently. Okay, now if I can get my pointer back, wherever it's gone, Pointer, pointer, where's the pointer? That's the problem with a black pointer on a black screen. Uh, yeah, oh, there it is. Okay. Let's go back to this. Okay, and let's go to this. Okay. Some troubleshooting tips. Is Elasticsearch running? Is it doing anything useful? Something like this. Curl and the address of your um, Elasticsearch engine. That particular port 9200. Underscore status pretty equals true. And it will send you a, if it's working, it'll send you a nice formatted page back of its status. So that you can actually see that something is happening with your Elasticsearch server that it is well and that it is uh, working. Now, how about being able to tell if Logstash and Elasticsearch are working together? That Logstash is taking stuff, putting it into Elasticsearch, and Elasticsearch is happy with it. Similar sort of thing, curl uh, a location for where it is, 9200, search, and that particular type of query type, since I'm doing with syslog data, and format it up nicely for me. And that will tell me whether or not the two are working together because it will give me information back on what's being put in as a syslog record. Okay, all of this stuff that you saw with those different dashboards is because I've written up a log stash configuration file to take the data that's coming in from syslog and massage it in various and different interesting ways. Um, and I think as a gentleman here was nodding his head up and down when I said log stash requires a lot of punctuation. Um, it does require a lot of punctuation and it requires getting it right. So um, how can you tell before you put, the, put it into operation that it actually is uh, syntactically correct? You point log stash at your log stash configuration file and say dash dash config test and it will run through and syntax everything for you and make sure that it is syntactically correct. 
Um, it will also run through, and if you reference a particular file, if that file does not exist, it will tell you that file does not exist, bro. You need to fix that. So uh, it will also let you know that something that it's expecting is not there. So uh, a gentleman asked the question about old data. One of the problems I had with Splunk was that I never could figure out how to get rid of old data. And my disk is filling up, and I need to get rid of this junk. I never could figure it out. It just wasn't in the documentation. So what I would have to do is as it was getting filled up, I just have to throw everything away, reinstall Splunk, and start all over again. Well, Elasticsearch doesn't have that problem. Um, I have a Perl script that goes through and deletes stuff out of Elasticsearch that's older than 31 days. So I keep 31 days of stuff around, which is probably about right. Because if I need to go back any earlier, I've got the raw syslog data that I can re-ingest back into a Elasticsearch in instance. And the Perl script is not, doesn't, just basically does curl uh, commands to Elasticsearch with the proper HTTP syntax that Elasticsearch expects for deleting data. And it just magically happens. So my disk doesn't fill up. A better way that I have since found is a program called Curator by Aaron Middlestein that lets you manage your Elasticsearch data and it just has a command line interface to it. So you just say, uh, curator, delete everything over 30 days, and poof, it just magically goes away. So it's, it's a great program. Um, remember I talked about the grok command, and that grok takes a pattern, matches that against your stream input, and turns that unstructured data into structured data. Well, how do you create those patterns? Well, it's sort of like writing a regular expression. We all know how we feel about regular expressions. We love and we hate them. But it's actually a bit easier with Grok because there's, there's this thing out on the internet called the Grok debugger. It's an interactive web application where you put your input into one text box, write your pattern matching string in another, and it shows you the results in another panel. So it's much easier to create your patterns that way. I use the Grok debugger all the time, and it's, it's really easy to use. Here's an example of it. Up here at the top, I have a syslog line, and there's my pattern matching statement. And what I'm doing is I'm saying syslog timestamp is a primitive inside of uh, Logstash. It knows what a syslog timestamp should look like. And if it matches that, if what is on the line matches a syslog timestamp, store it in syslog timestamp. Then there is a primitive for syslog host, what a host name should look like. If it exists, put it into syslog host name. And then data is just basically anything separated by blanks. Uh, if there is something that looks like data, store it in syslog program. And then it, there may be a positive integer, which is a syslog PID, and if that existed, it put it in a syslog PID and it ran out. But anyway, <clears throat> if your pattern matches your input, it breaks it down this way and shows what all the different components are. Syslog timestamp ends up being this, syslog hostname is G26, syslog program is term slip D, the syslog PID, and the syslog message. I use the, sys I use the Grok debugger a lot to create my patterns and it is really, really helpful to be able to uh, create a pattern interactively this way based on what my input is. And that's basically all I have. Here are the references. Uh, the top one is for Elasticsearch Corporation. Uh, you, from there, you can get to Kibana and Logstash and download them and get all the latest stuff. If you're interested in Logstash and their documentation, there's that. Uh, if you're interested in Kibana, there's that. Uh, if you're interested in looking at Curator to manage your indices and get rid of your data, there's that one. 
uh, for sake of completeness, there's fluent DNR syslog if you want to look at them. And the log state, the uh, Grok debugger. There I am, there's my title. I am the Information System Security Officer, and I made that comment. Somebody from the military one time asked me, gee, what branch of the military are you in? With a name like a Security Officer. I'm in Richland, Washington. There's my, there's my uh, email address if you want to send me email. Questions? Are you feeding data from security audience into this? Pardon? Mm -hmm. No, no. The two are separate, and I like to keep them that way so that uh, I'm not dependent on one or the other. And really, um, they serve different functions. Um, this lets me do log analysis, but um, Security Onion is more in the real time of network security monitoring. This is a little bit more, more after the fact sort of uh, viewing and querying because I'm looking at data over a time span. Whereas with Security Onion, I'm more concerned with things that are happening uh, at a much higher, at a much closer frequency to the actual event. Yes, sir. Are all your logical events the same, or do you have multiple filters like trying to apply to the log stack trying to match different logs? Um, actually, I am quite lucky in that uh, everything I have is coming from a Linux system, so all my log formats are the same. Now. Um, if I were, I don't do it, but if I wanted to, I could also process Apache logs. Uh, Logstash understands Apache logs very well, or, or the common log format for any type of HTTP engine. Um, there are lots of other lo uh, logging formats that Logstash understands. Um, it under, believe it or not, it even understands uh, the Windows logging format. So you could have all of your Windows machines uh, funneling into a different log stash instance and doing stuff with that and putting that into Elasticsearch as well. And that's the whole, that's one of the great things about the whole Elk stack is it all expands out horizontally. You could have multiple log stash instances funny, feeding into multiple Elasticsearch instances acting as a cluster and then Kibana running on different machines looking at the data. It all expands very well horizontally so that uh, as you need more capacity it just spread, you can just add it and spread it out. Yes sir? So uh, could you give me like a real high level overview of maybe if you got a new indicator uh, what you would do, would you be more in the Kibana area or would you be more in the, the uh, log stash configs to have it alert differently or um, like a threshold if you have like 500 IPs that you're looking for or a certain port would you would there be kind of one or, one or two of those that you would you would use to alert on that um, the way I've got it set up I'd probably see it in Kibana first mm. and then if um, more than like ad hoc, you'd go and put some hard rules. Yeah, if it were ad hoc, if it were an ad hoc, that, that's the thing about um, um, Kibana is, is that if I notice something in particular that might be interesting, like a particular IP address, I could create an ad hoc panel that would just include information, uh, queries related to that particular IP address or IP address range so that I could have a particular panel always up for that. Uh, and then if I wanted to do more, um, more analysis for it, I could go back and tweak my log stash configuration to tag those particular instances, uh, maybe put a, different, a wholly different type of tag if IP address uh, in 192, 168.101.0 slash 24 uh, tag equals super bad guy. And then I could create a panel that just had that particular tag and I could look at that. Or I could search by that particular tag in my query field also. So you would probably like program all your indicators to compromise or that sort of thing into, uh, into log stash and then tag them and then do them in Kibana? Yeah, so I would get them all in one, get them all in one, in one big quack. Yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, the slides will be up this afternoon. Great. Thank you. They will be PDFs. And this will be on YouTube. 
Okay. Other other questions? Did you try to make a licensing deal with Splunk? Like say, no, 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 no. Just let me do 2,000 uh, megabytes a day, and I'll pay a thousand dollars a year, and then. No, no, there. It, it doesn't work that way. At one point in time, <coughs> at one point in time, <coughs> DOE was talking about getting a basically a a DOE wide license for Splunk, and that fell on the floor because the price was going to be something like the national debt, uh, and it it just didn't fly. Um, logs, uh, uh, Splunk is very proud of their accomplishment and they want you to pay for their work. Um, and that's not to say that it's not a great program. It is, it's just that when you have the possibility of 1,500 different uh, hosts all logging at the same time, that's a lot of data. Um, I, I, can't, I don't know specifics on what I get a day or a week anymore because I don't care because it's all going into uh, Logstash, Kibana, and Elk, and I don't want to worry about it anymore. I don't worry about the size anymore. I just throw everything in there. But uh, for, for what I'm, I was talking about, the cost was just going to be excessive because you have, you have these processors that have 30, these boxes that have 32 processors in them, uh, 32 cores. They can generate an awful lot of data awful fast. Um, no, they, they didn't want to make a special deal, and no, it's, it's, um, their special deals aren't cheap. even their special deals aren't cheap. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. Hope this is helpful for you. Oh, um. For those of you that are still here, here is my little VM that, uh, let's see, uh, let me drag this, see if I can drag this over. Okay, there is my little VM that is running Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. It is CentOS, and if I can type this right, I type get enforce, and what does it say? It says enforcing, yes. I am running SE Linux on this instance, and I'm not having any trouble. You didn't have to do any kind of you know, fiddling with it whatsoever? Nope. Nice. None at all.